I'm going to talk to you guys about lateral approaches. Um, so who in residency, I always ask this every year because um, uh, it seems like every year more and more programs are doing lateral. So who, who's done a lateral procedure in their program? Raise your hand. Great. So more and more every year. Um, who has not done a lateral procedure before? Okay, cool. So less and less. So, um, so when I started doing lateral, like nobody was doing it. There was no codes. Um, and people were freaking out. Um, so we've come a long ways. Uh, and um, let's see here. So those are my disclosures. So this is a, a, a really cool um, slide that Shane uh, did and actually shows you what the lumbar plexus really looks like. And if you look at all the textbooks and the t you know neurosurgery, orthopedic training, who remembers being taught about the lumbar plexus? Raise your hand. Okay, you guys must have had some great teachers because for me, um, it was like this black box. No one really knew what it was. It's like, you know, the brachial plexus, you would memorize there's the roots, there's the trunks, and then you forget about it, right? The lumbar plexus, forget, no one knew, and they had all these fake diagrams and everything. But actually, this is what it looks like in real life. And just like I did in the lab, I mean, you don't see anything, you know. There and the and the, you know all the companies are trying to tell you to go lateral. Lateral is the best. You got to do lateral. But look at what you have to go through to do lateral. And um, and what I found over the last ten years, it's it's a very treacherous uh, approach, and it takes 50, 60 cases to really understand what it is that you're doing. Because I can tell you, I mean, I've had every complication you can think of. And being in the retroperitoneal space, um, the only time I got into the retroperitoneal space, and Charlie will tell you, was a, a shunt that, you know, it's like that catheter you thought you got in the peritoneum. And, you know, when you're a resident, it's like no man's land. That's the only time I remember. No one ever talked about the retroperitoneal space. I mean, it's maybe urology they do it. But we don't talk about it. It's like you don't even discuss it. Um, and if you do, it's because you put a shunt in the wrong place. That's the only <laughs> way. So, um, and I'll never forget, it was a catheter and it was coiled, you know. And when you're a resident, you know, your, your colleagues, Charlie's laughing. But it's like, you know, you never forget. You're like, and the residents are like, what an idiot. You put it in this, this retroperitoneal space. But, you know, we never, we never go there. So... This is another cool diagram um, that, you know, if you're doing, this is what you see when you're doing lateral surgery. You just see the bones. No one talks about the nerves. Um, but if you have a smart guy like Shane, he can basically, this is in the lab we did it, and he put um, uh, these copper wires through the nerves. So you can see on an AP, you can see how, how the nerves uh, go through there. That was an AP view, and this is a lateral view. So you can see this looks like, to me, the, uh, Neil, this looks like the Los Angeles freeway, right? 405, you got the Santa Monica, you got, you know, all everyone's trying to get across. You're going nowhere. <laughs> you're going nowhere. Um, so, uh, but if you're Neil, you know, you've got a nice convertible, you're enjoying the weather. So it doesn't really matter. You got front row seats to the Lakers game. Um, so I thought I would talk about, you know, some of the cases, just show, show you guys. So here's some cases and here's what we did. Um, and for me, lateral, really, I love doing it for revisions. Um, the fellows will tell you here, the current fellows will tell you I do it for everything, but um, I'm not sure that's necessarily true. Um, uh, but for, for me, it's, it's a great surgery for someone who's had previous surgeries. You don't want to dig through the dura, you know, scar tissue. This is a patient um, who had uh, seven surgeries, meningitis, I mean, you name it. Um, and, he, and he presented uh, with these x-rays. And you can see how they're, I mean, they took everything. Like, I think he got his facets taken out, the lamina taken out. Um, there's really nothing left. You can see he's collapsed. He's got complete collapse. So seven surgeries, this is a great uh, uh, approach. You go lateral, you can um, restore some of the height, and then you can get uh, a pretty good fusion. Um, and then we ended up doing, and then you can see, so this is the other thing, um, and you guys will see today, is doing the surgery is, is part of, right, 
but you got to be able to, in clinic, you see these patients. So um, the neurosurgeons are very bad about getting plain x-rays, but the orthopedic guys are so smart. They order x-rays on everything. And I actually ordered x-rays on this patient, and you could see how unstable this is. Um, and uh, you can see that's on flexion extension. Um, so, you know, usually I always, I always joke because I order all these, nobody moves on anything, right? Very rarely do you have this much motion. And so um, this, is, this is what we ended up doing for him. And you can see how much this thing moves on, on plain x-rays. So we did a lateral and then um, we did posterior um, uh, uh, fusion. And what I found with lateral is that you don't necessarily always get a solid fusion from the front, but the cages are so big that it doesn't go anywhere. So if it doesn't fuse, you know, you might get a little subsidence. But the important point is, is that the fusion from the back is still, for me, it's, you got to do a good job. So you can't cut corners when you're doing the back part. Um, and I think, you know, and you'll see, you know, there's some data to show like peak doesn't fuse as well as regular bone versus metal. Um, but one of the things you'll learn is there's nothing better than a posterior lumbar fusion. And even on this case, I think you could do, you could do many different approaches. You could do a T-lift, you could do a posterior lateral fusion, whatever you feel comfortable in, in giving the patient the best outcome. So, and, and here's to show you, this is two years post-op. You can see there's not one shred of bone. Um, and, you know, the companies will all say, oh, yeah, you get solid fusions after two years because we have these big graph windows. And, you know, there's not one single bone cell growing across the anterior. Um, you know, and this is two years. But he's got solid fusion from the back. And, um, yes, Rishi. Did you put it in or? Um, this was... Uh, I can't remember. I think we did perk screws on them. But still, you know, we did, you know, drilled out the facet joint. And um, I think we actually used BMP on him because um, he'd had so many surgeries. And, um, uh, but, you know, you can see, I mean, there's just, there's nothing in the front. And uh, they try to sell you all these bone grafts. You know, there's this cell, there's that cell. And, and really, I mean, I think it, um, it's such a wide surface area that, it just doesn't even hardly ever, you get sub subsidence, but the cage doesn't go anywhere. You know, the smaller cages tend to um, subside. Here's another patient. Um, again, I think, you know, she had AIS surgery. She's 80 years old. She's, she's on every single med you can think of. Um, and you can see, and I, on purpose, uh, I wish Bob Hart was here, um, is I cut off the, you know, the pelvic parameters and all the, you know, numbers and what's this, you know, incidence, what's the sacral slope. You know, sometimes you just have to forget that. Um, <laughs> because if you, if you focus too much on it, in fact, our old boss, Dr. Jane, used to make fun of it. And, uh, and you know, you just have to ignore it. Like, sometimes you just say it's too much, you know. This is an old lady. She's got radiculopathy. And what can you do to get rid of the leg pain? Who cares? She's never going to be straight again in her life, right? So you could, if Bob Hart was here, he would do T, T2 to pelvis. Um, and, you know, you could do that, right? I mean, but the main, main problem is, um, uh, is down low. You can see... She actually, it's incredible. She had, and she remembers she had this surgery at Shriners Hospital, and they took so much bone graft from the bottom, the whole bottom fused. So L4 to S1's fused, and the top's fused. It's only the segment in between. You can see it's just two levels. And, uh, and you can see she's got her main issues, radiculopathy, so foraminal compression. And I used to doubt, you know, my orthopedic colleagues because they would always talk about indirect decompression. And I was like, oh, they're just saying that because they don't want to actually go back and take the PLL out, right? But it, it works. And this is a case where I went lateral and, and it, was, it was perfect and didn't have to do a T-lift. We went in and you can see we restored the, um, the foraminal height. This is, a, this is what it looked like intraoperatively. Um, and you can see the spine basically open up and, and you can see how the nerve now is completely open compared to before. 
and her sim- her radiculopathy like immediately went away. But guess what? When you do lateral surgery, they all wake up with their thigh being numb. They're a little bit weaker, and it takes about six weeks for it to go away. So all this stuff, people say, you know, you don't have any complications doing lateral. It's all bullshit. I tell every patient, you can expect to have your your thigh's going to be numb. It's going to hurt for a while, and you're going to be a little weaker. Um, and when the fellows, when they're when they're on my service, they always go, oh, patient's doing great. And I was like, really? Did you check the hip flexion? Because uh, that's what, it's the psoas, right? And they check, they check the plantar flexion is always perfect, right? And they're like, patient's doing great. And I go by and they're like, you know, the grandma can't move her leg. You know, she's extreme, extreme pain. Um, and so it's a different, so it's a different exam. So when you do laterals, you have to look for other nerves. As Dr. Tubbs showed you, they're completely different nerves. Just get all the t lift, you know, all those different nerves out of your head. It's, it's a whole different um, neurologic exam. Here's another one. Um, uh, I wish Dr. Newell was still here. So this is a, um, a T lift that was done, and then the cage went backwards. And, and, you know, so this patient comes back. It's like post op day four. She like went home, fell, came back. And, you know, you can imagine they're like, gosh, you know, we had this surgery. What you could go back in, take it out from the back, which is perfectly fine. What if you go from the side and just take it out laterally and then, you know, it's a new incision, but you don't have to open the back part up. So that's what we ended up doing here. In fact, um, I think we did this case. Uh, Dr. Kazimi was one of our fellows. So news, you remember this case? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, and, and all the companies have these retrieval instruments. Um, and uh, you can go in, take the, the cage out and, and put in a, a bigger cage. So you can see there on the lateral, and you can actually hook it in and just pull it out. And so that's what we did there. And um, you'll see in the lab, I mean, this is what it looks like, right? And the lumbar plexus doesn't move. Like, don't fool yourself that you think you can somehow magically move nerves. They're totally fixated. Um, And in fact, Shane, we just published, there are these interconnections, and those are really important. So when you're doing lateral, you're like, God, you know, the case went great. I don't know how the patient had a deficit. We never saw any nerves. And, and what we found is actually it's the interconnections that people can have deficits. Um, so, again, this is an evolving field. Uh, you guys will learn a lot in the lab. Um, it's, it's really um, uh, a great experience to just go in. And, and I um, uh, cadaver stuff, you know, as surgeons, that's the, the holy grail. I mean, who cares how much, um, you know, you can watch videos, you can do surgeries, but doing, getting in the lab is really the key part. Um, and this is, a, this is an old exposure. This is one of Charlie's exposures. This is how Charlie does lateral. Um, he does a big incision. Um, and you can see, you don't need to make that big of an incision, Charlie. So... <laughs> And, you know, a lot of the stuff we'll kind of go over, you know, do you go from the left, do you go from the right, uh, wh- how do you decide which way to go? I used to go always from the concavity, I'm kind of gone away from that. Now I try to go for the apex, so I'll go f- for the um, convexity because the spine is closer. And then the psoas isn't as, you know, bunched up, so it's easier to get through the plexus because the psoas is draped over the deformity, so it's much easier to get through the um, the plexus. Here's a here's a great case. You know, here's someone who's got basically came in almost paraplegic, and they always come in. It's like one o'clock in the morning, right? Fellows calling me. There's this you know uh, seven year old who basically, and they actually had done a CT scanner two weeks before, and it just missed the thoracolumbar junction, and over like two weeks the whole thing collapsed, and she came in and. It's middle of the night, and, and we work here at this institute, and um, we don't, you know, it's always a pain in the ass to get the access guy to come, right? And there, you can never find him. You almost, it's like, it's like you have to align, you know, the stars to get him, them to come in. So what if you could do this laterally, and you don't have to have an access surgeon, 
it's minimal, you know, retraction time, all this stuff. And you can just go in like this lady. She became acutely paraplegic. You just take them right to the OR and do this. You know, again, it doesn't change. I don't want you to think, you know, minimally evasive. You still have to get this thing to fuse. And you can go all the way back. You can see when all the way back and took out the posterior fragment. And it's still like on this lady, she needed a posterior decompression fusion. So, um, you know, the techniques are the same. You still have to, just like if you did an open, you have to find the pedicle, you have to drill the pedicle out, you find the nerve root, you decompress the cord. And I use a microscope and I turn the patient, so I'm drilling, I'm going right towards the cord so you can see everything. Um, and the instruments now, all the companies, you know, they've got great lighting, you know, the, um, the retractors. When I started doing this, it was like they didn't have anything. You know, you're sitting there with the endoscope light trying to shine the, the area. Um, you didn't have any of the instruments, and that's changed. This is another great case. Um, I like using lateral for thoracolumbar junction. This is a patient who had um, a small fusion, fracture, continued kyphosis. Um, again, you can see you go lateral, and I went posterior on her so that going, you know, lateral doesn't change the fact that this thing has to still fuse. And they have these newer cages. All the companies have them. They have larger um, uh, footprint, but again, very small amount of bone will usually grow. You'll get some, but I think even these cages, there's less and less because the old ones, you know, you'd have a lot more bone surface area, but the higher chance of subsidence. Um, and again, not to, you know, be hard on Charlie, um, this is actually one of Kojo's cases. Um, this is how Kojo does um, his approaches laterally. You can see he's, there's like six pairs of hands in there. Um, where is Kojo? He ran off. So you can see there he's got, you know, I think vascular surgery, plastics, um, general surgery, and it's going to take him an hour to close, maybe two hours. And then that's my incision right there. So... Um, you know, it definitely makes the closure easier. And then here's another one. Um, and the reason why I wanted to show you guys this is that you can see when you're positioning, you got to get all the stuff out of the way. So EKG leads, whatever you have, you can see if you don't move stuff around, it can get in the way. Because when you're doing lateral, it's all about retractor placement um, and, and a good uh, image intraoperatively. So it takes a while to figure it out and um, you, you have to have a good radiology tech and, and positioning on the table and all those things make a huge difference. Um, and the more comfortable I felt doing this, you know, you really under, start to send, understand the anatomy and all the different approaches you can use. So this is actually uh, we did a corpectomy at L4 from a lateral approach. It's a patient who had um, uh, cancer. It's a great operation for cancer patients because, you know, you don't want to do this big exposure. And um, this patient had had radiation. And you can see there we, did, we went laterally, mapped out the lumbar plexus. And basically, you can see that's the cage we put in. Um, and you can do a lot um, from a lateral approach. Um, and then for revisions, again, I've taken out a lot of um, cages, um, a lot of, this is a case we did recently. We went in and, and took out the cage. This is another one where we went in. You'd see it's going out posteriorly. We drilled that one out. Um, so it's really, I think, you know, for me, it's changed kind of how I practice. Um, and um, it just gives you that extra approach that you might not have had in training. So. Great. Thanks.